Hey gang, before we go any further today, let me tell you about one of my other favorite marketing podcasts. I think you're really going to enjoy. Believe it or not, it's a fun and funny podcast about email marketing. It's called The Email Marketing Show. They recently did an amazing episode called Six Lies Your Email Marketing Platform is Telling You, which I loved because these guys are so genuine and real in their opinions about what's working and what doesn't in email marketing today. You should definitely check them out by finding The Email Marketing Show wherever you get your podcasts or at emailmarketingheroes.com. This podcast is coming to you on MPN, the Marketing Podcast Network. There's another show on MPN you might enjoy as well. I'm Jamie Lieberman, host of the UnBusiness Podcast. In each episode, we talk about the issues that face every entrepreneur where business and legal strategy intersect. Subscribe to the UnBusiness Podcast today. It'll make your business that much smarter. Just visit hashtag-legal.com or search for the UnBusiness Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. On this episode of Winfluence. There are fine-tuning things you have to do with a business as you grow, and that's one of them is not go crazy because a lot of times you'll be, these people get a brand deal for 10 grand. Ooh, I'm going to be getting a brand deal every six months or every three months. This is great. And they go crazy. Then they don't get another brand deal for two years, and that money is gone. There's a difference between being an influencer and actually influencing. I'm Jason Falls, and in this podcast, We explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate that difference. Welcome to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. When you have the opportunity to learn from a seasoned professional, you should always take it. When I found out I could get Chris Gibson on the line to pick his brain, as it were, about being an online content creator, an influencer who has created a career over the last 15 plus years doing that kind of thing, I knew I had to jump at the chance. Chris is known as one of the world's foremost skincare experts. He published a book in 2004 called Acne Free in Three Days. He went on a multiple year media tour and became well known before YouTube, Instagram, or TikTok existed. Then in 2018, he started paying more attention to YouTube and has since migrated his traditional media and website following to an active online and social media one. His experience of ups and downs of being a content creator are a treasure trove of knowledge that we will mine today. This episode of Winfluence is going to be a little different than my normal interviews, though. It turns out Chris had so much to say that I just stayed quiet and let him go. So I've edited things with more of a narrative approach to tie all the finer points together for you. I would love your feedback on what you think of this type of episode after the fact, but let me assure you, there's a lot here for you content creators to learn, and all of it is extremely useful for brands and agencies to understand too. Before we get to those insights, I want to share something our friends at Storyblock have to make you smarter. It's a new report called The State of Content Management, and is a very useful survey of 515 businesses in the U.S. and Europe, companies just like yours, and how they are approaching content distribution through their digital channels in 2022. Think about it. You have to provide content for your website. Maybe you also have a mobile app. Then there's e-commerce platforms, voice-activated speakers. Managing content is more complex today than ever. Get insights and ideas on how companies like yours are tackling the content challenge with the State of Content Management Report from Storyblock. Just go to storyblock.com slash winfluence for your free report. That's storyblockwithoutthec.com slash winfluence. Storyblock is a headless content management system rated as the number one CMS for 2022 by G2. It's also a new partner of the Marketing Podcast Network. Go get that report, folks. Storyblock.com slash Winfluence. That's Storyblock, S-T-O-R-Y-B-L-O-K. So without the C, dot com slash Winfluence. And stick around after the advice from our guest today. I want to remind you about an event coming up where we can meet up IRL. And I've got a discount code for you, too. So stay tuned. A treasure of knowledge for content creators and influencers, plus the rest of us. From the Acne Free in Three Days guy, Chris Gibson is next on Winfluence. Last week, I weeded my way through responses to a casting call email I sent for content creators slash influencers for a client project. 
I have a list of talent managers and managed service account folks I will periodically send a brief to and just ask for their help in identifying the right creators for the specific ask. I go through the suggestions with the client, decide on a short list of who we agree is a good fit, then I reach back out to ask for rate cards and pricing information. Inevitably when I do this, especially when I get to the part where I see what some content creators are charging these days, I think, geez, I picked the wrong vertical to create content around. It's not hard to see why lots of people want to be influencers or content creators. The getting is good. People are going to try and get. For those who listen to Winfluence regularly, thank you by the way, you know that we interview influencers and creators themselves from time to time. Those experiences shared are great sets of information and advice for aspiring creators, but also for the brands, agencies, and service providers working with them too. We all benefit from those conversations. But I wanted to dig back to someone who has been an influencer, if you will, for a long time. Someone who has survived the ups and downs of being a content creator online since before we were using the term influencer. I know from my own experience, their experiences can only add to the value we're trying to impart to you on Winfluence. Lucky for me, Chris Gibson had some time to chat recently. If you don't know the name Chris Gibson, you still probably know who he is. In 2004, he published a book about his experiences that created instant fame, and he rode that for a good decade. Chris is the acne-free in three days guy. I had acne as a big problem part of my life early on and, uh, you know, did all the things uh, that everybody does with the dermatologist. My parents wanted to make sure I didn't get scars. So I did all that and it didn't work. <laughs> I took medicines um, and I still had it in my late, well, my late teens into my early 20s, um, cystic acne. So after yet a one more try with a really famous dermatologist and expensive dermatologist in Dallas, where I grew up, um, they just handed me the same thing, a prescription for antibiotics and, and so on. So I tossed that little puppy in the trash on the way out after I paid the bill and started just looking into what was causing this. So of course, no internet in the eighties. Uh, so I did a lot of research, a lot of reading, um, and went and visited health food stores, which we today we have vitamin shop and GNC that none of that stuff existed because people weren't into that stuff. I was like kind of weird. Uh, but I learned a whole lot about diet and products and ingredients. And I was able to go basically that the premise of acne free in three days was the fast that I took. Uh, I went on a food, I went on a food vacation for three days. And when I went on that food vacation, uh, I stopped having breakouts. Gibson basically cut out sugar and dairy and the acne went away. He channeled his experiences into the best-selling book, Acne Free in Three Days. The book just took off. It really hit a nerve. A lot of people recognized that journey themselves, that especially adults um, that were still struggling with it. So the book took off and long story short, I ended up on television for it and it became a really big deal in the 2000s. His book sold millions of copies. He spent several years bouncing from TV morning show to midday news program talking about his dietary approach to getting rid of acne. He had an audience, a blog, and a website with lots of traffic. That was in the early to mid-2000s. Blogging was just coming to life for the mainstream consumer. YouTube wasn't technically born until 2005, a year after the book came out. So the popularity and audience Gibson built was the traditional PR way. All those TV appearances helped drive people to his website, uh, but it wasn't all glamorous. There's a fun element to it, but it's basically 48 hours of work and travel for five minutes of fun on screen or on camera. So Gibson realized that being a TV star wasn't all it was cracked up to be, and he still wanted to focus on helping people with their skincare issues. He became an esthetician, someone who specializes in skincare and a holistic health coach. His life's mission is to help people solve skin care issues. These days, he's also counted upon for anti-aging and overall wellness advice. That original audience stuck with him through the 2000s and into the 2010s. Then he started paying closer attention to the YouTube channel he first opened in 2010, but didn't really prioritize then. He began intentionally posting advice there in 2018. People are still interested in skincare and wellness because I was on intermittent fasting trying to lose weight. So I kind of vlogged that journey and did some videos on that. So the channel did really well initially um, as on, 
for YouTube. I mean, YouTube, if you have, you know, a thousand subscribers, you're not doing badly, really. <laughs> but it's grown a whole lot since then. I've evolved the work that I do to include anti-aging, which seems to be a real hot topic with the same group of people that had acne issues that I was dealing with. So now I still help folks with acne, uh, but I use my esthetician skills, nutritionist skills uh, in the focus of anti-aging more than I used to. So everything has sort of evolved and this huge following sort of showed up again. Some of them people that knew me from before, uh, but mostly new people. And so uh, the channel has kind of exploded and it's 122,000 subscribers, which is a lot. When you hear Chris talk about his audience and his channel, you quickly realize why he's so successful as an influencer and content creator. We talk a lot in influencer marketing conversations about transparency and being genuine. When I asked Chris why he likes YouTube so much, his answer revealed what genuineness really sounds like. It's fun to help people and see them get results and kind of help solve that conundrum that's out there about skincare because there's so much of it and there's so many skincare products coming out all the time, celebrity skincare lines that cost a whole lot of money. So people, I just did a consult consultation yesterday. I don't do very many anymore, but that was the whole crux of that consultation was it's so confusing. What do we use? How do we know if it's working? How much money should we spend on it? When should we know it's not working and to give up on something? So those questions are big questions. And that's what I try to, to help answer. And his content is loaded with practical advice for people having very specific individual problems, which makes it stand out. It's helping people save money and figure out what's right for them because no two people are alike, even when it comes to skincare. Something that works really well for someone else, something I learned in the acne battle, doesn't always work for everyone else. So, you know, one person will get good results, one person will get no results, one person will get worse. So it really is is really is factoring in what your body's trying to tell you. So he started creating videos and studying the search algorithms on YouTube. He wanted to grow his audience and help more people, but he was smart to study the mechanisms on his channel of choice to take advantage of the opportunity. His audience grew, and as he produced more and more videos, each answering very specific questions or offering solutions to very specific problems, he got bigger and bigger. I asked him when he knew he could make a living from being a content creator versus all the other consulting and things he may have done to make ends meet. When you start having feedback from people that are very engaged and loyal, I think the thing that gets missed, um, even with social media, and of course, I did social media personally, you know, like everybody, but now it is a, a tool for me to get information out. Uh, and the engagement factor is what's missing with a lot of people. A lot of people will even pay to get followers. They will pay companies just tons of money to try to get exposure. But what keeps that growing with the tipping point is definitely engagement. Those loyal fans you can have, and, and I see this on YouTube all the time, there are engagement rates uh, that we're able to see in the YouTube dashboard. And engagement rate is how often people come back and watch your videos, you know, how often do they comment, all those types of things. And there are people with millions of subscribers and they're very successful because it only takes a fraction, remember, to make money and do that. But their engagement rates are 1% or less sometimes. Uh, my engagement rate's 9 to 10%, which is extremely high. What that means is you're creating relationships with these people. These are people who are going to go out and tell other people about you. These are people who are going to buy your book when you bring it out. These are people who feel like part of your brand family. So Chris Gibson emerged as an internet star. He had become a YouTuber. His content was great. It was engaging. His audience was growing. But he had been around through a swell of success before, back in the TV morning show days. He knew how to handle running his business as a content creator. When you have a few minutes with someone that has that much experience and wisdom, you dig in and learn. So for you influencers and content creators out there, get out your notepads. Some good advice is coming. I started out asking Gibson why he was so focused on YouTube when Instagram and TikTok seem to have a bit more mainstream cachet these days. Do you know, I'll be honest, I'm not 
focused hard on Instagram. I'm starting to now or TikTok because I'm a believer that you pick one platform and master it first before you reach out. And that one platform will do to a degree feed the others. We'll feed them for you. And then you can focus it after you've got one down, you can, you know, start to focus on another one and do more with it. Um, I think the mistake a lot of people make is to try to hit the wall, like the spaghetti on the wall. I'm going to do this and I'm going to see which one is going to do better for me. Now, in the beginning, the one good thing that comes out of that is that there'll be usually a preference you have for one, one that you're just more comfortable with, one that you like a lot more, one that rings your bells. That's the one to start with. That's because there are plenty of people making big bucks and building big followings on Instagram that don't do YouTube. Same thing for Twitter, same thing for TikTok. That's the one, you know, YouTube, being on camera, being able to talk to people uh, and let them see me because what I look like is such a big part of my brand. I mean, I'm 58 years old. That skincare stuff I learned has really paid off well for me. So people pay attention when they hear my age. They go, okay, wait a minute. (laughs) I sure did. When he dropped that 58 years old on me while we talked, I did a double take. We were doing a video call so I could see him. I would have laid money. He wasn't a day over 35. So his anti-aging techniques aren't just good YouTube fodder. They actually work. Now, you might think that a guy who wrote a popular book and did the TV tours of duty back in the day launching a YouTube channel meant instant success. Not so. Gibson says finding audience online takes time, and you have to start specific before you work yourself out into assuming your audience is interested in the rest of your life or expertise. My channel is a little got a little odd thing about it because a good portion of my videos are to solve a specific issue. So a person's going to come in, watch the video, go and do whatever, get the results, and they may never come back and watch a video again. So it took me a while to get traction because that's the nature of skincare. Oh, that solved my, they may come back and say, great, or they may tell somebody, hey, you can watch that video Chris gets put out on that issue because it was really helpful. But now over time, and it's taken four years, now I have that 100,000 subscribers and about 10% of them, which is very high, believe it or not, um, are very involved, very engaged and watch all my videos. So it's really, really great, even though a lot of times I'm talking about the same thing. (laughs) People just like the video. So, you know, and I put out polls, I poll my folks. They want to see, they want me to bring back DIY skincare, some cooking shows, which I did in the beginning, healthy food for healthy skin. And obviously I'm into fitness and other things I have available to me as tools to help people nutrition. So I will be doing that. But when you first start out, you got to niche down and focus. You got to focus on one thing to find those people. And then when you get bigger, you can start putting out stuff. You may not get as many views or anything, but you'll get some, but you'll start to pick up that type of audience that goes, Oh, this guy does skincare. Cause usually people have a, just a, a whole plate full of things that they're trying to address. It's not just finding the audience that takes time, but finding your comfort zone with your own content too. When I started my YouTube channel, I had gone from doing live television to YouTube, which is very, very different. Live TV is very quick. It's five minutes. It's very on the point. And you don't have a lot of time for jokes and personality or to tell a story unless they ask you in the interview. So it took me a while to adjust to the format and feel free enough to like mess up and leave it in or show the dog and leave it in, you know, whatever. But I did make the initial thing in my head and the initial decision that I was going to not be in a hurry and do the best job with the videos I could, because when and if it grew and blew up, people would go back and watch them. And I didn't want, while the the delivery not may not have been as good or the editing may not have been as good. And believe me, there are some videos I terribly edited the content would be good. The information would be solid and it would work. And that's what's happened. So, you know, year three was my year. I didn't know how long it would take, but year three, you know, I hit that 10,000 and then six months later I was at 50,000. And then three months later I was at a hundred thousand. That was in August. Now I'm at 123,000. That patience and focus on content coupled with his passion for serving his audience has given Gibson an audience. Any content creator would be happy to have. How does he think new creators could build the same for themselves? It's easier to start with your local influence a lot of times when you're trying to start out with whichever platform. Um, Tagging your town, tagging your city, tagging restaurants you go to, especially if you're doing Instagram, taking pictures, lots of life stuff. 
um, will help you get that engagement and get that following faster because people are interested in that. And it also, you're building a community of people that are solid on what you think, what your core beliefs are as they get to know you. What happens is you get better at your messaging. They make you, they force you by asking questions or by you put a post out and nobody likes it. And you're like, okay, what happened? I have all these people that are locking. So you, you sort of get the feedback to kind of know um, what your branding is really all about. It's that branding, he says, that takes you from creating content to building an audience to becoming an influencer. And with that influence comes the opportunity to collaborate with brands. Now, this is where Gibson's advice becomes quite sound, in my opinion. Remember that he kind of started with an engaged audience and is very genuinely focused on that audience's needs. He's not into this to make a quick buck like many influencer types seem to be. I almost thought he was going to tell me he only sells his own products and doesn't do brand collaborations, but I had to ask. And then he doled out the best advice one content creator could give another, I think. I say no a lot. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. You're going to get a lot of crap offers. Don't take them. Don't take crap offers. And you'll know they're crap because you'll feel like they're crap. <laughs> you'll know. You'll just intuitively know this is not what I deserve to do all of that. So don't get locked into a lot of work for no money. That's just ridiculous. And there are there are those that will do that. I saw that especially after 10,000 subscribers, 50,000. It's bumps up. Now I'm at a hundred. When you get to 500 and a million from the guys that I talk to the, in my period, it just is like they hire people to go through those because they're just ridiculous. Don't be mistaken though. Gibson isn't anti-brand collabs. He just advises tread softly. Brand deals can be really great um, for you if they're a match with your, as I said, your branding and your belief system. Skincare for me has to do three things. It has to help a person not empty their wallet and not do them more harm than good. So it has to fit in those that triad of intention for me before I'll even look at it. So there are brands that I have mentioned in a video that have come back to me and said, hey, will you do a deep dive on this product? Because I'll do a lot of comparison products where I do, you know, four or five similar things and talk about the benefits of each. And so I think in total, and I've been doing this four years, I've done six of those and they weren't for a lot of money. I didn't do it for the money. You just have to, it has to fit and you're going to know intuitively. I can't imagine that if you're at a point where a brand is, is talking to you about doing something with them where you're going to have to tell people this brand paid me or sponsored me because you do have to do that. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. You're, if you have any question in your mind that your subscribers, followers, what have you, will go, eh? don't do it. It's not worth it. Um, you'll alienate them. They may not all jump ship, but you'll tilt their idea of your brand uh, that you're just trying to make money. Did you hear that? That's an extension of him being so genuine to his audience and focused on his audience. You might think brands would shy away from someone so careful, and many should, but smart brands seek out influencers like Gibson because they know those are the ones that are going to ultimately be more valuable in terms of a return on the investment. So I asked him, for someone so protective of the audience, so focused on not crossing that line to just dropping ads on them, how do they react when you wind up with a brand collaboration? Generally, what I hear back from people is, wow, I'm so glad you got somebody to pay you. <laughs> you do a real, you know. So when I do one, I don't think I've ever had a negative, negative impact. I always recommend, pro it's a little bit easier maybe for me because I always recommend products and I provide Amazon links for people, which I do get paid a small percentage of that. And believe me when I tell you it's small, it's small, but it adds up. You know, it's a source of income. And when you get large enough, again, as I said, those uh, influencers with millions and millions and millions of subscribers, only a fraction of them have to move for them to make a ton of money. Speaking of the audience reaction, what about community management? Personally, I see a big void in today's Instagram and TikTok influencers in terms of engagement. And by that, I mean them engaging their own audience, responding to comments, directing the conversation 
and even directing the audience to more personal connections with the creator, with themselves. Gibson has a vibrant and active community on his blog, which is a Mighty Networks community site. Think of a combination of a blog with active commenting and sort of a forum of topics and conversation underneath. That's where you'll find Chris engaging with his, quote, family. But he also minds the shop on YouTube comments and more. I don't really lean on that. But what I what I do try to encourage with my guys, both on the blog, which is why I chose not to do a Facebook group, I chose to do a Mighty Network, which is similar, but it's very interactive where people can talk to each other. They talk to each other. They can direct message me. I can post my content. So that blog is very different than the typical type of blog. So I direct people there because I want people to help each other out because no one has all the answers. And so what I'll find on YouTube, which is very refreshing, I don't ever once in a while I get a troll and I just get rid of them. I just block them from the channel. I'm not going to deal with it. You're not going to bully another subscriber for their question. If the minute I see that and I'm very diligent with my comments, um, I take them out of there. That's not the environment I want to create. It's my channel. So we say, you should leave that in there. No, I'm not doing that. That's my channel. And I want people to feel comfortable to ask what they need to ask. Cause sometimes skincare questions can be a little embarrassing, you know, to the person who has them. So I'm certainly not going to create that kind of environment. So again, now we're talking about my branding. Now we're talking about the type of people I have as subscribers and they help each other out more often than not before I get to the answer to answer. Sometimes they've been made suggestions and I just give them the thumbs up or I'll say that was great. When people come back and share their experience, good or bad, I say, thank you for coming back and sharing that experience. So it really gives people a sense of connection. Uh, That's real. That's not made up. I mean, I'm not doing that as some sort of tool or manipulation to grow. It's just the environment I want people to be in. And uh, it works. It works very, very well. People stick around. I don't lose a lot of subscribers. He doesn't lose subscribers. He gains them. And not long ago, he surpassed a milestone on YouTube. He hit the 100,000 subscribers mark. And perhaps explaining the sometimes unethical behavior some people use to buy followers, Gibson admits 100,000 is a key to unlocking a new level of YouTube success. But, he says, be careful whose advice you take or use to get there. When you get over that 100,000 mark, the platforms treat you better. I mean, that's not going to lie. The algorithms treat you better. Your reach is better. You have momentum over people that have smaller channels. Is it fair? No. <laughs> but it is how those things work. So if you can stick it out, it's not, it is not a sprint. It's definitely a marathon. Those people, and I have seen them blow up really quick, they're not prepared. You know, I had a skincare line in place, a little small one. I did all this stuff when I was small so that as I got big, like the blog was before I had people to put in the blog. That thing was developed, had content in it ready to go. Of course, this wasn't my first rodeo, which makes, I guess, what I'm telling you valuable because I did it from scratch in the 2000s. So I had a little, you know, (laughs) we need to have this in place and this in place and this in place so that when people get in there, There are places for them to go and learn. And I had to revamp my website. I'm in the middle of doing it again. It's making the decision. I'm going to do the best job I can to be consistent, which is very important to all these platforms. I can think of one of them, except maybe Twitter, that if you don't consistently post, you just get lost. You have it's volume and, and showing up daily, you know, Instagram, you could still do every few days. If it's a really good post, uh, that you don't overwhelm the guys there where they just they just don't pay attention. That's the problem with Instagram is that they see you too much. They just quit paying attention. YouTube's a little different. If you're good, you can do a video per day, but it'll kill you. <laughs> Unless you have a team, it'll kill you to do that. I do three. The algorithm seems to reward and like people who do videos every 48 hours because that video sits on the home shelf where people can see it. The minute you do a new one, it knocks it down. Maybe not off, but down. You know, there's some things, sometimes I put a video out, it just does insane. I won't do another one for four or five days. I let that one ride the crest, but I make sure I'm pumping out stuff in the community tab and I make sure that I'm still there and I'm on the blog posting written content or articles or stuff for people to read so they don't think I disappeared while that video gets its juice, so to say. So there's a lot to learn. Look at the people and there are good ones on all of these platforms that that offer free advice, the free stuff. Uh, They have paid, 
But you, if you read enough of that, you'll glean enough of the things that you need to know to grow. Gibson says there's an easy way to differentiate between the hucksters and the course selling set that actually have good advice. It's all about the engagement. I would say on Instagram, seek out the ones that are very engaged where you see comments and they're answering them. That's the person you want to buy their course from. Not somebody who's got all these. You go in there and go, that's weird. They have like 150,000. They never answer a comment and they only have five comments on their post. That doesn't make any sense. So, you know, there are things like that to look for. You want an interactive person who's doing walking the talk. So skincare videos, a book that still sells, but is almost 20 years old, and he doesn't do brand collaborations very often. It might actually be hard to imagine exactly how he can afford to just do this for a living. I mean, quick math tells me he doesn't have one huge revenue stream the way many of today's content creators do with frequent brand collaborations. YouTube ad revenue is good, but with 100,000 subscribers and not a million subscribers, it's not likely enough to not have to do something else. So how does a content creator in Gibson's shoes actually make money? Where does his revenue come from? Well, I just asked. You know, there's a myriad of ways. And as you get creative, you'll find them. The first, of course, with YouTube is the AdSense revenue. When you become monetized, it's very few cents on the view, but they add up. So as you get bigger, it becomes a, a, I would say that's my number one source of revenue. Then, of course, if I recommend a product and it's available on Amazon, I'm an Amazon influencer. I set myself up as that. There's also uh, Narrative, which is kind of a new player. They're similar to Amazon. You put the product in, they create a shop link. The nice thing about Narrative is the links never expire and their software looks for the product. So if someone goes to, say, like an Amazon and it's out of stock, that software will look for it. So I use both. Amazon's primary, Amazon's been very good to me. If you do well for them, they reward you in ways. They put you in special programs, you get special bonuses, gift cards, like ridiculous amounts of money come from them um, if you do a good job for them. And they tier it out, but it's invitation only. You can set up your influencer account, but if you do well, invitations will come to you from them that you don't, programs that people don't know about. Obviously, I do have books. I give my acne free in three days book, uh, the, the ebook away free. Now it's an older book. I tend to give the ebooks there free. You don't have to do that, but ebooks are definitely catalogs, ebooks, special guides. You can charge just a, a dollar for, or you can do a YouTube video and say, here's my skincare guide. It's a buck 99 cents. You can set that up on sales for free. It's Stripe is the company that does the payments. They're like PayPal but you don't have to mess with it. It's like a merchant account and you get paid every month. So that's why I do only because they've demanded that I do this. I've done some private consultations. So if you're an expert in a particular area or you're certified or licensed, if it's necessary in those areas, definitely in the beginning, do your one-on-one -on -one consultations. People want that stuff. They'll pay you a hundred bucks for an hour. That's nothing anymore, but it adds up. You do 10, 15, 20 of those. In a month, boom, two grand, you know? Oh, I have merch now. <laughs> forgot about that. So the nice thing about YouTube and, and, and Instagram and all these, you can create merch at like, there are a lot of platforms, merch platforms where you create the merchandise, you don't pay anything. They ship it out. They get a little cut. Then you, you've got merch that people can buy. So if you're the kind of brand, like I have a new one that says be beautiful. So it's B-E-Y-O-U. To full. So I just did a whole, I did cups, you know, tumblers, all that stuff, put it out and people love that stuff. If you know that people like that kind of thing, don't do logos at first, do something fun and creative because logos people don't buy. We, <laughs> I did logos, you know, people think, well, you know, unless you're Regis, I mean, not Regis, uh, what's that? Ryan and Kelly, a logo is probably Later on, when you're like a PewDiePie or somebody, you know, if you've got, I could probably do logos now, but in the beginning, that's what I had and nobody bought that stuff. So what they like, the be kind, love the skin you're in, be beautiful. That's all my kind of branding stuff. They love that on a cup's cool looking. So think, be creative when you start your merch. You, can, you don't have to do a few things and they don't cost you anything at those platforms. That's a great thing. And then you can put them in your shop on uh on Instagram and stuff. 
So to sort of restate what Gibson just explained, your revenue as a business comes from a variety of sources. There's ad revenue, affiliate revenue, brand collaborations, consulting. There are even more options if you're not afraid of or are interested in a little extra work. I haven't done events. Um, I have not done memberships. Those are all available. There's Super Chat on YouTube. If you're a YouTuber, I don't do those right now just because my time is so tight with the three videos. Uh, They're bringing in like a super fan thing. It's not everybody has it where people can actually, if they liked your video, they can give you money. There's going to be a little, some people have it. There's going to be a little, you know, there's like, dislike, love. There will be a little icon where a person can actually give you like a donation, like money for doing, helping them. So I think that's going to be a really big thing for people. I think much more so than the memberships, which is probably why I've stayed away from that. One, you got a membership program, you got to deliver. And that's a monthly thing people pay. I don't like them. (laughs) I don't like paying that stuff. So I think the super fan or whatever they've got the name for it, I think that's great because if people are in control and they can give you something, but they don't have to give you something every month. Now, if you've listened to this show for much time at all, you know I've been cautioning content creators about putting all their eggs in Mark Zuckerberg's basket. In other words, if you put all your content on a social network and that's the only place you can engage with your fans, you are at risk of seeing your influence and audience go away one day. Yes, it's a little doomsday-esque when you consider the practicality of that happening, but social networks are unstable. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok... Any of them could suddenly outlaw brand collaborations or severely cut the profitability of creators going officially through those networks for them. They could also suspend your account, accidentally remove your followers, all sorts of possibilities. I've been predicting that many creators are going to start moving back to blogs, email newsletters, or even subscription-based content platforms where you, the creator, own the audience as well as the content. It doesn't belong to Zuckerberg or anyone else. Gibson, without prompting, offered eerily similar advice. Try to have a centralized place eventually, like a Facebook group, if that's what you, if you like Facebook and you're really comfortable with that, or a Mighty Network or something, there's a lot of these out there. Try to form a place where people can go that are off platform so that you protect a portion of your fans and your list from any untoward things that could happen, like YouTube going away, which I don't expect that to happen. But, you know, I learned in the 2000s, things go away. MySpace went away. There's a music services went away. A lot of things go away or change. But you can get hacked no matter how good your security is. That's always a big, big worry. Back up everything you've got. If you've got videos, put them on the clock. Back up, back up, back up everything you've got so that if something happens, you're not dead in the water that you've got. Plus, you'll sleep well at night. No <laughs> You have, you have backups. And I think a lot of influencers don't think about that. They think Instagram's forever or their account's forever. They think YouTube's forever or their account's forever. And they're just crazy people out there. So, you know, do that for sure. You know, back everything up that's important to you. Keep Like I keep all of my stuff I created in Canva, I have that. So I can always repost it if I needed to. And as any good marketer would, he says you have to create that space, but you also then need to promote it like crazy to ensure your core fans are connected there. And encourage your followers to go there. Um, you know, I don't do it in every video because I don't want to like beat a dead horse on YouTube. You, you got to be a little bit different than everyone, but, but make sure that it's prominent. Make sure you talk about it at least once or twice a month. Hey, you guys that are new may not know I have a blog. You know, it's off platform. You can talk to me there and it's easier than me trying to find your comments or same thing for Instagram. Join me here. This is the family place. This is the place. And then make that very friendly. Don't overpost. Don't try to sell people stuff all the time. I've gotten a few of those. I get right back out. You want to keep up with those people on those plat, you know, your blog or whatever you're using, but you don't want to, you don't want to push them away. That's sort of the safe haven for them. So where they can get access, you can, you can catalog your material and make it easier for them to find. Same thing I find with a lot of podcasters I've been encouraged because I've been doing a lot of podcasts lately and we have talks after. And that's one of the things I encourage them to do is be sure that they have a place besides the podcast where people can go and find their material because these platforms do not always make it easy for people to find your stuff. 
you know, I'm lucky on YouTube. You can now type in my name and any skin issue and the video will pop up. But I even at the end of my videos tell people that now because people don't think about that. They're, I can't find your video. Oh, easy. Chris Gibson, acne. Boom, boom, boom. There they all are. So let's close the circle on all this. We started off telling you about how Chris Gibson got his start writing a book and then building an audience by doing TV morning shows. He still does a fair amount of those TV morning shows. Once you do a good job on one, you have a reel to promote yourself to others. And it's usually live TV, so they don't want to take a risk. They prefer someone who's done it before. But you can't just walk into a TV station and say, interview me on the news. That kind of thing happens for an influencer when they invest resources in PR, public relations, or more specifically, publicity or media relations. Chris has an expertise about skincare. He knows there are lots of ways to build his audience, but he knows from experience that one good way is to get in front of a lot of people at once on television. So he still invests in PR. Here's Chris on why that's a smart play for you content creators. When you can afford to have PR done, you can do a great deal of it yourself. There's There are tons of books out there. Marsha Friedman has one on how to do that, how to get into papers, newspapers and stuff. It's a a book you'd have to pay for. That was my publicist back in the 2000s, by the way. It's hard to find a good publicist. A lot of them want money and they don't deliver. Try to find them that it's you pay for what you get and they're out there. Pay, you know, if they get you a radio show, then you pay them. You pay for it, you go on, but you pay for that. Try not to get roped into these monthly recurring costs for PR that don't deliver anything to you. That's dead in the water. The other thing is, I'll tell you, I'm going to be very honest, don't change your lifestyle. When the money starts to come in, don't go buy a car. Don't go. I bought a trash can. I needed a new trash can. That's a true story. I bought it. That was my first treat to myself when the money really started to come in and be better. Take that money. Don't change your lifestyle unless you live in a hut and you really need to move. That's different. But leave it. Leave your life the way it is for a year or two and take that extra money and reinvest in PR. Reinvest in, in whatever you can do to get yourself out there with it because PR costs money. It's not cheap. But you can get in podcast programs for monthly to $6,000 a year. That's not a lot of money when you stretch it. And they get you 10 or 15 podcasts a month. That's one. You know, television, I'm going back into TV. Obviously, I have someone helping me do that. It costs money. But I'm willing to take that money and not go take a cruise, even though the pandemic is just now ending and we all want to be on a cruise ship somewhere, to take that money and reinvest it in myself and the brand because I don't really need the vacation right now. I've been sitting at home for two and a half years. So I don't need a vacation. What I need to do is grow my visibility and grow. I don't like to say following because it's really not my focus, but grow my visibility, get my information out, get the help. But that's my focus. And then the subscribers kind of come. But when the subscribers come, you have to be careful not to let it go to your head. Egos ruin everything. Never believe your own press, good or bad. Just look at it for what it is. Don't get big headed. You know, if you get a lot, I'll do a video. Sometimes it hits a nerve and the, the, the comments are amazing. They're super nice. But all I say is thank you. As Chris mentioned a moment ago, it's not just your own press you shouldn't believe, but also your own success. That's not to say one shouldn't be confident or even revel in the fact they've built a nice following and even a nice income stream. But remember, Chris Gibson was big in the mid-2000s, then went away from the always-on-TV or YouTube thing for a bit. He had a lot of money in 2008, then not a lot of money in 2009 and 10 as the recession took hold. He says wisely, don't count on the money to always come because one day it won't. Don't trust it. Don't trust your money either because all of these things have up and downs. You need a couple of years of data to know when your money is going to shrink, when YouTube is going to slow down in January, February, March, so that you're not rolling high on two, three grand a month going, woohoo, I got my, you know, and then suddenly January, February, March, you get half that money. You need to have a baseline. So I, you know, I don't mind sharing people. I made a baseline of what I need to have every month to live on comfortably and do my, do my fun stuff. And anything above that is fine, but I have to watch for those dips. So I knew that January, February, March are slow for YouTube. So I knew I was going to dip below. So, you know, I didn't spend a bunch of crazy money at Christmas and the holidays. I didn't travel and do a whole lot of that kind of stuff, even though it was open to me. So, there are, there are fine-tuning things you have to do with a business as you grow. 
And that's one of them is not go crazy because a lot of times you'll get, these people get a brand deal for 10 grand. Ooh, I'm going to be getting a brand deal every six months or every three months. This is great. And they go crazy. Then they don't get another brand deal for two years. And that money is gone. And they didn't spend any of it on upgrading, get a better camera, get a better laptop, buy a course that teaches you more, mentor with somebody. All of those things are really important. I didn't get where I am by luck. You know, I just put a post out that says, sometimes you got to create your own luck. (laughs) And that's what you're doing. When you start reinvesting in this stuff and learning and expanding your reach, you're creating your own luck. Because the bigger your reach, the more opportunity for people to see you, the more their brand deals are going to come, the more those subscribers that really are going to be your raving fans. That I have people from 2004 when that book came out that are still following me today. Now, that's a fan. That's tw- almost 20 years. And they've seen me through the ups and downs, through the success of the book, through the disaster of the 2009 super recession, which just ruined everything for everybody. And having to rebuild, they know about my mom has, they, they, they know my life story. So they have stuck, that's like family. Some of those people know more about me than some of my family members. So you want to cultivate those folks and have them in your fold because they will stick around when things get sticky and things will get sticky. All business things, you'll run into something. We all do. He says that doesn't mean you need to be a hermit though. I'm not saying don't enjoy it. Do get your stuff, do what you want to do, but In the beginning, you cannot trust this money to be the same every month or more because it does not work that way. And nobody talks about that. You know, you see these influencers that suddenly are having to sell their houses and, you know, in California and they get rid of the cars and they'll come up with some kind of story of why they're doing it. And what's happened is they've got their lifestyle so high and so expensive and their money has changed. The great thing about being in charge and owning your own business and being in charge of your life is that there is no limit to what you can do. Like there isn't a nine to five job. You're stuck with whatever your check is unless you change your job and then you're stuck with that check. The negative is it's a wild horse. And I don't know anybody from Tony Robbins. And I know a lot of really famous people with a lot of men that have not gone through that stage. It's baseline. This is my baseline. This, I know that this up and down is above that. And I'll always be here because I have things in place. All those revenue streams, like you asked about all of those things, diversification and visibility, all that stuff is so important. As we wound the conversation down, I felt like I'd been given a masterclass in being an influencer. Gibson certainly had great wisdom to share. I'm sure glad he shared it with us on Winfluence. Again, you can find Chris Gibson on YouTube on the channel Chris Gibson Live. His blog and community he mentioned is at skinsofabulous.chrisgibsonlive.com. He's on Instagram at Chris Gibson Friends. One last thing today, folks. The Influencer Marketing Show is fast approaching. It is in New York City on April 27th. I have a discount code for you to get tickets to join me there. So get out a pen and paper or get that URL bar ready to type it in. The Influencer Marketing Show is being held in North America for the first time this year. It's a one-day event in New York City, just off Broadway at the New World Stages on West 50th. It will be Wednesday, April 27th, 2022, coming up in just a few short weeks. I will be chairing one of the stages as well as moderating a panel featuring Pete Kennedy from Tagger, the presenting sponsor of this podcast, and Jenny Heinrich, who leads Influencer Marketing Strategy for Ketchum, one of the Omnicom companies. So go see the full speaker and topic lineup and get your ticket at jason.online slash IMS Falls. That's jason.online slash IMS Falls. And when you check out, use the code FALLS, all caps, F-A-L-L-S, and you'll get a 15% discount just for listening to Influence. That URL again is jason.online slash IMS Falls. So this was a different approach to the podcast today. I'd love your feedback on how you like the narrative form versus the live interviews we typically do. I don't do this type often, so jump over to the emails and tell me what you think. Record a voice memo and email it, or if you don't want to record yourself, just send a regular email to jason at jasonfalls.com. Have a different question or topic about influence or influence marketing you'd like my take on? Send it to that same address, jason at jasonfalls.com. I may use it to inspire a future episode. If I do, I'll send you a signed copy of Winfluence the book as a thank you. 
Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is an audio companion to my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my periodic newsletter. Or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening. And remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. Greetings, you marketing podcast junkies. This is Tim Hines, the host of the Marketing Starter Podcast on MPN. On the show, I sit down with marketing thought leaders and pioneers from around the world and unpack how they use an entrepreneurial spirit to excel in all that they do. So tune in on your favorite podcasting platform every other week to find new ways of kickstarting your marketing career. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit Marketing Podcast.